Good evening, everybody. Um, the room is already shut down. Everything's turned off. Fans are off. Actually, um, our storms are really bad outside, and I brought this. Um, it's my cymbidium. It's, I had it sitting outside. It's just sitting on that tray while it's inside here. It wasn't sitting on a tray outside, but it's really grown, grown well. It's gone, gone crazy. <clears throat> Lots of new growths and stuff coming out of it. It's only been outside for a day or so, and um, I brought it in. It's just been, it's getting beat around with that storm. A lot of wind on it, so um, <clears throat> I just brought it in. But uh, it's doing well. I'm out here looking over a few things. Um, not really going to talk about nutrients or anything. I was actually going to answer a couple of questions. I got a couple of great questions. I always get good questions. But um, Stacy asked me a couple of questions. She said. Um, about measuring nutrient solutions, um, I want to make sure I'm covering the, the part she's asking about. She asked me several questions, but um, I don't measure runoff. Um, taking a known water and pouring it into your pot and collecting the water underneath it and measuring it. Um, unless you really know what you're doing, you can get a lot of false readings off that. It's not necessarily the media that could be affecting it, although it could be. Um, it's not necessarily your bark or your your moss that you're getting the pH reading from, it could be nutrients left behind. Runoff to me, and again, this is one of those topics that um, if you took a bunch of hydro growers and put them in a room together and at a table and start talking about runoff, that would be one that would probably start an argument. There's a lot of opinions and everybody has a different take on it. Um, <clears throat> I guess here's my take on it. <laughs> it's a great question though. Um, I don't monitor runoff. I pay attention to what they. I, I think it's more important to take to pay attention to what the plant takes in versus what they what they leave behind or what they put out. Although it is important information, it's also very misleading, um, and there's different things that can affect it. Um, if you feed your plants in a hydroponic solution, if, let's say you, um, and I'm talking about. Um, where you have a liquid solution all the time in a tank or a reservoir. If you feed your plants in a hydroponic setup like that, um, at 6-5 and 24 hours later you come back in and check the pH of the, the solution and let's say it's down to 5-8-5-9, um, more than likely that means they pulled all the nitrogen out of the mix the plants have where they're feeding heavily on nitrogen and so the ratio of Phosphorus and potassium has now risen versus nitrogen because they're eating all the nitrogen up. It's leaving more phosphorus and potassium behind. So in turn, those are dropping the pH of the mix. See what I mean? Um, if we came in and the pH was up around 7.2 or something, I would think, all right, well, they're eating all the phosphorus and potassium out of the mix and they're leaving more nitrogen behind. We're getting a higher pH because of that. Um, but it also, there are other factors to think about too. So. When you're measuring runoff, it's, it can be very, very misleading, and certain nutrients um, blended together can affect pH also versus one nutrient. Um, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of information there that can help you. Um, even the parts per million of it, I mean, obviously if you, you're feeding your orchids, you know, 100 parts per million most of the time, and you measure your runoff and it has 450 parts per million, you obviously need to flush. Um, <clears throat> that would be very obvious. Um, I think you should know that already though. I don't think that should be how you need to judge that. Um, I don't measure the runoff. I have before um, on mine. The orchids that I have in gravel and rock and lava rock and usually the parts per million is anywhere from 4 to maybe 12 parts per million. It's very low, very residual, very little residual left. Bark would have more. Um, moss or something like that because it's organic it's going to retain more and it's also going to hold on to certain nutrients um, every media has its own quirks um, like cocoa cocoa has a has a weird ability to to hold on to potassium things of that nature to kind of hoard it um, and not hold on to calcium that's why you have to feed a lot of calcium if you're feed, using cocoa products um, different medias do different things um, i'm in inert media though and it's not, even, um, it's not even like a lake of beet or a hydrotone. Most of the stone, gravel, river rock and stuff, river rock and pea gravel is mainly hard stone, quartzes, that type of stuff. Very, very, very little absorption at all in that. Um, it's basically just something to hold them in the pot, just an anchor. 
it doesn't provide any nutrition or affect the pH or anything in the solution. That's why I, I like growing with it because, um, and I don't want to turn this into one of those conversations about media, but that's why I like it because I control it very, very much. It's, I'm not, it's, it has no influence on the um, pH or anything, the stone that I use. <clears throat> lava rock, etc. Now, lava rock will, because it's more porous, it will absorb more moisture. Um, but I use that as a tool. I use that to my, to my benefit when I'm growing. Um, but at the same time, it will hold on to some nutrients. It will suck up some nutrients, so it needs to be flushed a little bit better. Um, because I feed low amounts of nutrients, I don't, I don't have to worry about that. My, um, like I said, the residual that I see is very, very low amounts. So, um, <clears throat> measuring, measuring the runoff again is, for the average person, um, it's not going to give you any information that you can really use very well, other than a high parts per million or something like that. Um, but um, you, if you're flushing your plants on a regular basis and feeding proper levels, you shouldn't really have any buildup. Um, my plant, my pots, plants have been in these pots going on a year, most of them now, and uh, I'm having very, I don't see any residual buildup or salt buildup on my pots. But, um, <clears throat> and I let them sit and soak in the solutions. Um, but again, I think it's how the, the, the amount of mix and everything else um, that was a great question. I hope that answers it. I hope it does. But um, you can measure the runoff, and if you if you want want to use that to your advantage, or you think you're, the information you can you can in, interpret it any way you like to. But uh, that's how I interpret it. It's stuff that the plant doesn't particularly want that they've discarded, um, and there may be something there from your media. But um, it can be very deceiving. Just be careful with it. Be careful with it before you make changes to your grow based on that information. Um, I would prefer to monitor the solution that I'm feeding versus the what the plants are giving back. Um, one of the other questions was, where can you find information on what individual orchids or individual plants want nutrition-wise? How do you know because of the big structures if one of them needs more calcium, etc.? That's a great question. Um, I'll put a couple of links up for different types of um, tissue reports, and that's what I kind of look at when I'm looking for that kind of information. Um, they're not for everybody. Um, sometimes they can be difficult to read and misleading, but they're very eye-opening also. A lot of information in them. Um, I'll mention some stuff in them again some other time. I just want to answer the question, questions in this one or I'll get long-winded. Um, the tissue reports are where they take a, a plug out of a leaf of a plant, and typically it's a plant that's growing very well or is the um, perfect example of what they're trying to grow. And they take a plug from it, so it gives them a nutritional breakdown of what's in that plant's tissue. And um, those reports can be um, very helpful, a helpful tool for finding out what information um, or what nu nutrients the plant has in them and at what quantities and what ratios. Um, being new to orchids, um, I can't tell you exactly how to interpret these reports. Um, other type of reports I could do a little bit better job, but again, it's been quite a while since, I, since I've been involved in that stuff. Um, <clears throat> But that's a good source. Um, they're also very eye-opening just because the results, some of the, some of the research shows in some of these reports where they do tissue sampling. Um, it makes you think about how things actually might work, how calcium is used by some of these plants and other nutrients and um, how the environment has influenced them so much and you have to keep that in mind or it, that will come back and haunt you. That, that really has messed me up horribly trying to answer some of the questions and trying to figure out how them to grow. Um, that was suggested to me early on by people and um, look at the genetics, listen to, think about genetics, think about the individual characteristics, you know, their environment and stuff. Um, now I'm using it to my advantage and using it to figure out how they grow. But um, a, for example, would a plant that grows in a warm environment, would it need more calcium than a plant that grows in a colder environment? Um, would they need more calcium? A plant that grows in a warmer climate versus an orchid that grows in a cooler climate, which one would need more calcium? <clears throat> Everybody would probably say the orchid that grows in a warmer climate because it would have a higher rate of growth versus one growing in a cooler climate, right? Slower rate of growth. What if a cooler one, though, and this is where those orchid, those weird influences brought on by environments you have to think about them in a different way. It's not all black and white. It's kind of a weird gray area. These are some weird little creatures. 
What if they need the one to grow in a cooler climate, needed more calcium to build a heavier cell structure in their leaves to protect them from, so they didn't get damage to their cell structure or leaves at colder temperatures? Phalaenopsis can't take a whole lot below 60 or 55 degrees before they start to suffer some cell damage in their leaves, most of them, most of them. I see it in my own like that and others that I've seen. Um, but there are other orchids that can take it down to almost freezing and some down even to that. I've seen them with snow on them in pictures. Um, <clears throat> Do they require more calcium to, to build maybe a heavier cell structure that would protect them at lower temperatures, possibly? So, I mean, the logic would think, no, the, the ones in the warmer climate automatically would. That's just logic. Everybody would automatically think that, myself included, but you have to think, think the opposite, too. You have to think a little bit different about it. There's a bunch of instances like that you'll see when you look at those reports. You would think a dendrobium would need, and they do, they do require more calcium and more nitrogen also because of their cell structure. Um, but what about a what about a fast growing plant versus a um, a slow growing plant, um, or is there a difference in that? Um, for instance, when I was looking up some dendrobiums um, in one of these reports, it talked about they showed their calcium levels were quite a bit higher than some of the others. That nitrogen levels were quite a bit higher. Matter of fact, I think they were the highest in this one report. <coughs> Excuse me. But the highest in the calcium on the on the list was um, this bobophyllum, and I thought, is that that bobophyllum with that big, that big leaf, that big phalaenopsis type leaf? That um, <coughs> excuse me. So it possibly could use all need extra calcium for that great big leaf structure, maybe. I looked it up. No, it's a bobophyllum with a little bulb and um, this little strap leaf, this little strap leaf. I thought, why would that need more calcium than a big dendrobium with this great big structure? What, that just doesn't make sense. <coughs> so reading through some of the, looking up the plant in a couple of different books and a couple of different things on the internet and looking through some of the descriptions, one of the final little sentences I saw where um, it said, um, a very easy grower um, will double in size, easily double in size in one season. And th that must be it. it Instead of it growing one, again, this is just my hunch, but um, it would stand to reason. Instead of it growing that one great big structure, like a, like a dendrobium would, um, it grows maybe 20 structures as it moves across its mat. That's its growing habit. And the growing habit is, a lot of it's influenced by the, the new, or a lot of the growing habit, or the nutrient intake is influenced by the growth and habit growth, or habit of growth such as that one, they require more calcium because they grow 20 structures versus the one great big one. I would have never thought of that, but um, and it takes just a second to look at it and then it kind of starts to become obvious. There's a lot of patterns you can start to see when you're looking through some of those reports um, and the research results and some of the research is, is astounding. Um, if they take, and there was one phalaenopsis research where they took um, like 10, and it was all meristem clones, so the tissue-wise they're all identical. Um, and they took 10 of them, put them in bark, and 10 of them put them in moss, and they fed them different, they fed them all the same fertilizer, but they varied the from zero to like 500 milligrams, the potassium level, to see what the potassium level from zero to 500 milligrams would, would show in each one. And they used moss on 10 of them and bark on 10 of them. And it was amazing. Um, it was amazing the amount of growth the, the ones with the low amounts didn't grow that well, and the higher ones didn't grow that well, but there was, a, there was a magic, you know, a happy medium in the center where the plant grew the best. And what I thought was amazing was the ones that grew them, um, I think it was moss, not one of those that grew a spike, but they had more leaves than the ones that were, grew in bark. But the ones in bark, almost every one of those grew spikes, or multiple spikes. It was a very interesting report. I'll try and put the link up there, but... Um, Interesting, interesting stuff that you can find from those research papers. Um, for people that are interested in that tech part of it, or interested in um, that information to help with their with help with their growing and um, help with their um, ability to <clears throat> understand how they absorb nutrients and stuff, that's a great idea. Um, and again, I'll try and put some links up for that. Anyway, great questions, Stacy. I hope I answered them. If not, let me know, and I'll be happy to mention something again. Um, I need to talk about calcium and a couple other things again one afternoon just to, for a few people who are struggling with that. This is all some really odd concepts sometimes. Hydroponics is a bit of an odd concept to, be, to understand. 
um, because everybody's so used to soil growing and what they've learned over the years and what you find learn in school and hydroponics um, not, not a lot of people talking about it or teaching it really um, not until recently um, but uh, <clears throat> And there's a lot of misleading information out there too. So, I hope I covered some of that and helped with that question. Anyway, great questions. But um, thank you very much, and um, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for listening. <laughs>